Hello guys, you are watching Railways Explained. In previous couple of videos, we've dealt mostly with China, its high-speed rail network and Belt and Road Initiative, but also we spoke about maglev technology and its application in modern transport systems. If you agree, now it's time to change geographical and political hemisphere and visit the United States. Our today's topic has for a long time been on our list. The reason why the preparation of this video took so long is because the infrastructure project that we are going to discuss has been happening over a long period of time with a lot of twists and changes but also controversy. Therefore it was necessary to check all these details and find a way to sum them up into one comprehensive video. In the following 20 or so minutes, we'll talk about construction of a famous high-speed railway line in California. Let's waste no more time and proceed with the video. California has been evaluating the potential of constructing a high-speed rail line for almost four decades. The state first pursued the idea of a Shinkansen-style Southern California high-speed railway line, which was initiated by private firm American High-Speed Rail Corporation. In 1981, this company started negotiations with relevant authorities and even launched activities related to obtaining required documentation. However, by 1984, it was all stopped officially due to lack of financial resources. Then, the idea of Californian high-speed railway line was revived once again, as growing population of this American state became an increasing strain on its highways, airports and conventional railways. At federal level, as part of the High-Speed Rail Development Act from 1994, Californian high-speed railway line was identified as one of five priority corridors within the U.S. high-speed rail planning. This time, the planned route linked the major metropolitan areas of San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco Bay and Sacramento via San Joaquin Valley. A year before, the California legislature created the Intercity High-Speed Rail Commission, which was charged with determining the feasibility of construction of such corridor, and in 1996, the commission issued a report that concluded that such project was feasible. Also in 1996, the California High-Speed Rail Authority, or let's just use the term Rail Authority, was established in order to begin formal planning and preparation of a ballot measure. Ballot measure in the United States is some form of referendum, where a piece of proposed legislation is put on a public vote in order to get either approval or rejection by the public. In the year 2000, the detailed study was conducted and project proposal was finally shaped, in the form as we know it today. The ballot measure was scheduled for 2004 general elections, but the state legislature voted its withdrawal. Finally, after more than a decade since the initial proposal, the project received voters approval in November 2008. On a ballot measure in what was called the Proposition 1A, with the support of 53%, the public approved issuing of $9.95 billion for the future high-speed rail line. This act also included the funds in the amount of $950 million dedicated for financing the capital improvements of commuter, intercity and local transit lines, which are supposed to complement the future high-speed railway line. Of course, Proposition 1A and legislation that followed also set some standards and performance levels that the future project should meet. The most important three were the following. Where conditions allow, minimum speed of the service should be 200 miles per hour. Maximum travel time between San Francisco and Los Angeles should not exceed 2 hours and 40 minutes. And the high-speed rail should be financially self-sustaining, which means that the operation and maintenance costs should be fully covered by the revenue. The decision to finally start the project was made in 2011, after the detailed environmental studies have been carried out and the procedure of public opinion gathering has been completed. 
Okay, after this brief timeline, we must say a few words about what exactly Californians have voted for. The project of construction of Californian high-speed rail is actually divided into two phases. Phase 1, which refers to the 520 miles long section San Francisco, Merced, Los Angeles, Anaheim, which is the section that was approved by Californians as part of Proposition 1A. But we also have the Phase 2, which refers to the future line extensions from Merced to Sacramento and from Los Angeles to San Diego, with a total length of 280 miles. In that way, the whole project actually covers 800 miles, including up to 24 stations with design speeds of up to 220 miles per hour. Rail Authority decided to begin construction in the Central Valley on the first section from Merced to Bakersfield in the length of 174 miles. And that's one of the most controversial parts, in addition to skyrocketing of project costs. However, before we jump to controversies, let's first discuss whether California should have a high-speed rail at first place. Successful introduction of high-speed rail services requires satisfying a certain set of preconditions. Among most important is the one which says that high-speed corridors should be located between large urban areas with strong traffic flows spaced ideally between 100 and 500 miles. Distances below 100 miles are best covered by car or conventional rail, while distances above 500 miles are best covered by the airplane. Given the fact the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles is about 450 miles, California's high-speed rail easily meet this norm. In terms of the size of the cities that this line would serve, Greater Los Angeles area and San Francisco Bay have a combined population of about 28 million people. Traveling from San Francisco to Los Angeles by plane usually takes less than an hour. But if you take into account door-to-door -door travel times, which include travel times to and from the airport, check-in and security procedures, the travel time between these cities becomes more like 5 hours. In spite of all inconveniences, Los Angeles-San Francisco corridor is one of the busiest short-haul flight corridors on the planet, and by far the busiest in the United States. Regarding the ground transportation, travel times that you are seeing on the screen may be the best shows the time savings that travelers might realize in case California becomes high speed. High speed train between all the pairs of the cities that you are seeing, at least for a double, cuts the time you would otherwise spend in a car, not to mention conventional railway. But, of course, the metal always has two sides. Some argue that California lacks geography, demographics and even cultural tradition that all played a significant role in countries like France, Germany and Japan, which to a certain degree made their high-speed trains economically viable. As we already indicated, some serious criticism is related to the decision to construct a first segment of line in California's Central Valley. The reason for this is the fact that the cities along this segment are relatively small and unlikely to generate any significant amounts of traffic. This is even more problematic if you take into account that the financial arrangement which would ensure financing of the complete project simply does not exist. Even the selected route to connect LA and SF is sort of debatable. Some argue that politicians, in order to fulfill campaign promises and enable access to high-speed rail to certain cities, influence the route to change its most reasonable course. Also, the lack of political support is obvious, public opinion is divided, and private investors lost their interest, which are all essential for any project of this caliber. At the end, maybe the most significant argument against this project is related to the project costs which are, according to some, simply too expensive. And furthermore, the prospects of finding money which would cover complete projects are not that good. But before you draw a conclusion, let's first take a deeper dive.
We said earlier that on a ballot measure, voters approved this project and approved the issuing of 9.95 billion in bonds to commence with the construction. It was planned that this sum will be enough to cover approximately 20% of total needed investment, which is projected at $45 billion during 2008. The federal government also joined the club, but with only a symbolic $3.5 billion. The problem was, after construction started, due to issues with acquisition of land, environmental requirements, consultants, etc., the projected costs of the project skyrocketed all the way to $98 billion. However, if we stick to the official data, according to the business plan of Rail Authority for 2020, cost estimation of the Phase 1 is $72 billion, including the savings which arose due to decision to share the part of the route with the existing commuter rail. This, of course, will have the impact on maximum speed on certain segments and, in that way, on total travel times. In addition, besides state and federal government, rail authority secured certain amounts of money from the so-called cap-and-trade funds. The cap-and-trade program is basically a program that creates a powerful economic incentive for significant investment in cleaner, more efficient technologies. 25% of annual cap-and-trade funds went for the purpose of this high-speed project, and in that way, as of December 2019, Authority received $3.2 billion. In addition, Rail Authority assumes that cap and trade funds will in future provide between $500 and $750 million each single year. Now, if you put all we said onto one pile, between now and 2030, Rail Authority can count on a budget between $20.6 and $23.4 billion US dollars. While this amount of funding is considerable, it is still far from enough to complete the phase one of the project. As we said, the section from Merced to Bakersfield was selected to be the section where the works will start. In fact, they started five years ago and today we have approximately 30 active construction sites spanning 119 miles from Fresno to Bakersfield. These works are divided into five construction packages and now we will try to say a few words about each. For CP1, design-build contract valued at approximately 985 million was awarded on August 2013 and it covers the initial segment from Adera to Fresno. Construction was originally expected to begin in 2013, but it has been delayed due to slow pace of property acquisition until 2015. A groundbreaking ceremony was finally held in Fresno on January 6, 2015, which marked the official beginning of sustained construction activities on this project. For CP2 and CP3, Design-build contract was awarded on December 11, 2014 in the amount of $1.2 billion and it related to the design and construction of a 65-mile stretch from the south end of Fresno to near the Tulare Kings county line. CP4 in the amount of $347.5 million is related to the 22 miles long segment from Tulare Kings county line to the city of Shaftar. Originally, the CP4 was supposed to cover 30 miles all the way to Bakersfield, but it had to be shortened due to disputes with the cities of Bakersfield and Shafter. Dispute is related to the need to renegotiate the routes through these two cities. In addition to these four, we have the CP5, which is yet to be defined and developed. In any case, if you want to find out more about the scope of each of these CPs, you can check out the link in the description. Just to help you understand the scale of this project, we will mention some activities beside these packages. For example, in the Bay Area, Caltrain is electrifying the 51-mile commuter rail corridor between San Francisco and San Jose. Rail Authority contributed $714 million to help convert this heavily used rail line from diesel to clean electric service and to lay the foundation for a high-speed rail shared-use corridor. 
in the Los Angeles Basin Rail Authority is helping the LA Metro with $442 million for the Phase A of the Link Union Station project. In an effort to transform Los Angeles Union Station into a world-class transit and mobility hub, which includes high-speed rails. We are not going to discuss current progress of works, bearing in mind that construction sites are not continuous and they span over, as we said, 30 different places. If you still want to know more, Rail Authority has a fantastic site where you can find all the details that you might need. For today's video, let's just have a look into the deadlines from Rail Authority's biannual reports. The business plan for 2012 predicted the 2028 as the deadline for completion of the Phase 1. Of course, as time passed, the deadline was delayed. New deadline for Phase 1 according to the business plan for 2018 was set to be 2033. And for the Merced-Bakersfield segment, deadline was postponed from 2026 to 2029. But, as would some say, Rail Authority never fails to disappoint. In business plan for 2020, they set a new deadline for Merced-Bakersfield as 2031, which let us assume that the whole Phase 1 in best-case scenario cannot be completed before 2035. That's of course the case if Rail Authority managed to find sufficient funding, which at this moment sounds like a dream. Now, before we come to a conclusion, let's at least try to give you an insight into the million-dollar question. Will California high-speed rail line ever be profitable? Well, short answer, most likely no. According to strict definition of profitability, this project will hardly ever pay off, just like in case of most high-speed projects anywhere else on the planet. If that answer works for you, you can stop the video here. If you want to hear the but part, you are on the right track. In search for the answer, we again reached out to Authority's business plan for 2020. It gives some data about ridership and forecasted revenue for each year from 2033 to 2060. The applied model has three scenarios, or simply put, it gives data for high, medium and low ridership and revenue we decided to stick with the data for medium scenario. So, for the first year of operation of Phase 1, it is expected to have about 12.1 million transported passengers and a revenue of $1.2 billion. After 12 years, for example, model forecasted ridership of 40.5 million passengers and a revenue of $5.3 billion. On the other side, Estimated costs of operation and maintenance for the first year of operation are expected to be $770 million. After 12 years, those costs are expected to reach $2.4 billion. When comparing data for the whole period from 2033 to 2060, it is safe to say that this high-speed line is expected to cover its operation and maintenance costs. Not only this, but also predicted revenue will in addition generate more than 70 billion US dollars by the year 2060. That might be enough to cover even the investment costs of the project, of course, in case they remain on this level. Also, beside these costs that we mentioned, there are other costs that were put out of equation, such as depreciation and general costs, including overheads and fees. In order to determine the exact level of coverage of total costs of the project and operation, we would have to analyze more documents, including the feasibility study. In any case, we might leave that for another video. Because, as we already mentioned in some of our previous works, waste majority of high-speed railways are not even being built to make profits. As an old proverb say, the rabbit sleeps in another bush. For the end of this video, we could talk about the requirements and issues related to environmental protection, land acquisition and property rights. We could also discuss poor management, endless lawsuits, profitability issues and many other things. But we won't. It's all already well known. Actually, we are thinking to draw attention to something other. 
we said that current projected funds for this project are somewhere between 20.6 and 23.4 billion dollars. And yes, we all know this is far from enough. The state of California provided all but 3.5 billion which were obtained from federal government. This is only 15% of these projected funds and only 5% of the total value of the phase one. If America wants this project completed, this seems to be quite unacceptable. We will remind you that the federal government built the nation's interstate highway system through securing grants to the states that covered most of the construction costs. We all know what the impact of this investment was on nation's economy and what it meant for the mobility of American freight and citizens. But also, we all know that this system is not profitable. With high-speed railways, we are talking about something which represents a commitment to a cleaner and more sustainable transportation. We are also talking about something that moves people away from roads and airlines. We are talking about something which will reduce congestion and boost productivity. And we are talking about something which might reduce US dependence on foreign oil, increase economic activity and, at the end, create additional jobs. In any case, if America wants to prove it is able to complete this project and finally starts developing its high-speed rail network, we think it is necessary for the federal government to show additional commitment for this project and help out the state of California. Also, the benefits of high-speed rail must be assessed at larger scale and in that way presented to public. The words high-speed railways and direct profitability in majority of cases should not be even put into same sentence. The benefits of high-speed rail should be evaluated through global impact on the economy and the citizens. Without going into much details, we will only give you a few hints. Mobility of people, availability and affordability of transport, better flows of workforce, relief of urban areas, opportunity to live in cheaper neighborhoods, impact on the environment, many, many other. Finally, we do believe that this project might be quite beneficial for the American society and that the US have the capacity to complete it. But not before it is set as priority, by both the officials and the public. Don't get us wrong, but the lack of money should not be an excuse for further delays. If you allow us to make such comparison, the value of this project is only one-tenth of the US military expenditure in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2019, which according to the US Department of Defense was $778 billion. This was Railways Explained, until the next time, goodbye.